So today I'm here talking about gold in Virginia. Um, I work for the Department of Mines, Minerals, and Energy, which regulates the mining industry in Virginia. We have about 400, 420 or so active uh, mining operations in Virginia not right now, not counting the coal mines. That would just be the sand and gravel and industrial minerals and crushed stone and things like that. So uh, it's quite a large industry in Virginia. Um, and uh, our agency is in charge of making sure that workers are safe and that the environment is protected while this um, industrial process happens. So uh, today I'm talking about gold in Virginia and let's get right into it. So what is gold from the eyes of a chemist? Gold is a chemical element, um, atomic number number 79. And you can see it there on the periodic table. And I'm gonna use my um, mouse. I hope people can see my mouse. It's not very big, but um, yeah, we're gonna be talking about gold, atomic number number 79, but also I will be mentioning some of the lighter elements up here in the upper left and upper right hydrogen and helium, and then lithium, the lightest of the metals. And I'll also at some point mention uh, iron and nickel. So gold is a chemical element, but it's also a precious metal. So it's something that humans consider to be precious uh, because they're rare. Um, gold occurs naturally uh, and along with um, it's a precious metal along with other things that you may or may not have heard of. Well, silver uh, but there are other precious metals, including the platinum group metals, ruthenium, rhodium, palladium, etc. So gold is an element and it's a precious metal and it's also a mineral. What is a mineral? Well, a mineral is a naturally occurring crystalline solid that has a specific chemical composition. And in this case, the chemical composition is simply gold. One element in this mineral. Other minerals, say quartz, have uh, multiple elements in quartz is silicon and oxygen. Calcite is uh, calcium, carbon and oxygen. So um, it's a very simple mineral and it can take a number of different crystal forms. Here you can see some of the crystal forms from um, the Roraima Shield, Roraima Shield District in Venezuela. So gold um, occurs in different ways. Uh, why is it precious? Well, it's relatively rare in the Earth's crust, only um, four millionths of a gram per ton in the Earth's crust. Uh, I'm sorry, four thousandths of a gram per ton in the Earth's crust. And it's uh, nearly chemically inert, highly resistant to combining with other chemicals. And so uh, it, it tends to stay by itself. It doesn't oxidize um, or sulfidize or... Uh, form nitrates or salts or anything like that. So it's um, highly malleable and ductile, easy to work. It has very high electrical conductivity and it's good. So it's good for electronics, but it's shiny and beautiful. And I think that's why we really like it. Um, what are some of the things that gold is used for? So about half of the gold produced each year goes into jewelry. 40% goes into things like gold bars for investments, and 10% goes into electronics and other industrial uses. As you can see, there are quite a few countries that produce gold, the biggest one being China, uh, followed by Australia and Russia, but the United States ranks fourth in the world in the production of gold right now. And right now, Virginia is not producing any gold commercially, but um, the, the largest gold producing state in the nation right now is Nevada. Well, how is gold formed? It's a chemical element. It's not the sort of thing that you can take uh, a lump of iron and turn it into gold, although that's been tried. That was the aim of the, the medieval alchemists, but no one ever succeeded in doing it. Really the only way that gold, elemental gold can be formed is by nuclear fusion. And so this happens normally inside of stars. Um, so the lighter elements, hydrogen and helium and lithium, I mentioned them earlier, formed in the Big Bang at the very beginning of the universe. So there's a lot of hydrogen, helium and lithium floating around the universe. But elements heavier than lithium, heavier than atomic number three and lighter than nickel had to form uh, by nuclear fusion and essentially a star burning up its fuel and combining 
the nuclei of atoms to release energy. So um, the, the heavier, the lighter, heavier elements up to about atomic number 28 form um, by nuclear fusion inside of, inside of stars. But elements heavier than nickel, including gold, um, have to form in a different way, and they form in supernovae explosions. And this is now we're getting into the realm of astronomy, but it's important to, to consider uh, the processes, the, the astronomical processes that have given us the wide range of elements that we find here on Earth, including gold. So here's an artist's conception of the early days of our solar system, a swirling cloud of of gas and dust. And, and all these elements would have been in here because um, the, this cloud of gas and dust it represents the remnants of, of stars that formed and um, had nuclear fusion going on and then exploded earlier in the life of our, our galaxy. So our galaxy is probably about 13 billion years old and our solar system's much less than that, only about 4.6 billion years ago. So really all the heavier elements and all the gold in, in our universe, in our solar system and on Earth were, were there pretty much at the beginning of the, the solar system 4.6 billion years ago. Um, but in the early days of the Earth, the whole Earth was molten and fairly uniform when it congealed out of that, that cloud of dust and gases. Uh, but very early on, the Earth went underwent differentiation by mass. So the heavier elements were drawn by gravity toward the center of the Earth to form the core of the Earth, uh, primarily iron and nickel. But when the core of the Earth formed, it sucked in um, most of the other metals with it. So that the, the core of the Earth is very, very rich in metals. And the exterior of the Earth, the crust and the mantle, are relatively depleted in in um, metals, but here you see um, an artist's conception of that early, differentiate, early differentiation where the metals were going toward the center, center of the earth and things like silicates, uh, minerals based on silicon and oxygen were working their way toward the, the outer layers of the earth. So, so all the gold in the early earth would have ended up in the core. So how did we end up with gold in the crust of the earth? Well, it turns out that, um, Oh, more than half a billion years after the Earth was formed, we experienced the what they call the late heavy bombardment, which was a, a heavy bombardment of, of meteoric material coming from um, extraterrestrial objects, uh, rocks, and space debris. Now, this is where the moon got most of its craters was in this late heavy bombardment. And the Earth would have had many craters too at this point, but they've been mostly um, erased by erosion. The moon doesn't have an atmosphere to perform erosion, so the craters get preserved. But uh, uh, this is a fairly new theory, but it, it's pretty well accepted that a lot of the, the gold in the um, crust of the earth came from this late heavy bombardment. So how then, if gold is only present in, in four thousand, thousandths of a gram per ton, in the Earth's crust. How does it get concentrated into things like nuggets and veins that, that we find when we're, we're mining for gold? Well, the answer is plate tectonics, just as plate tectonics is the answer to almost every other question in the geosciences. Uh, so the Earth's outer layers are not static. They're very dynamic. Um, the continents are made of relatively thick crust. You see here on the right, relatively thick crust that has generally a granitic composition, the composition of, of granite. So lots of silicate minerals, um, uh, quartz, feldspar, mica, things like that. And then the oceans have a much thinner crust, much thinner, much younger crust with generally basaltic composition. So also silicate minerals, but silicates that would uh, tend more toward the iron and magnesium silicates. And so, um, the ocean crust essentially churns uh, by forming new crust at these spreading centers and destroying older oceanic crust in subduction zones. Subduction zones either going beneath continents, as you see here on the right, or subduction zones going beneath 
other oceanic crust, as you see here on the left. But either way, um, because we're pulling uh, a lot of oxygenated and fairly light elements and minerals down into this, into the um, upper mantle where it's very hot, those things melt relatively easily under those conditions of heat and then bubble back up toward the surface. So subduction zones, places where crust is being consumed uh, are often associated with a nearby string of volcanoes, either on land, such as the Andes in South America and the Cascades in the Pacific Northwest, or you end up where two plate pieces of, of ocean crust are coming together with a chain of volcanic islands like Japan or the Philippines. Um, so, so this, in this way, uh, the Earth's materials, the Earth's crust get recycled and even further differentiated. And so these processes, uh, the melting and the production of vapors, and then those vapors and melts moving upward through the crust and coming out uh, as volcanoes and volcanic ash and, and altering the crust on their way up. This is how many, many mineral systems form, including gold deposits. As you can see here on the next slide, so this is a conceptual model of how many of the gold deposits form on Earth. And as you can see, it looks very much like our plate tectonic diagram. So it's similar. We have a uh, continent here on the right with the ocean crust being pressed beneath the continent. And in the middle, we have two um, slabs of ocean crust coming together. Both of them have subduction zones. Here we're forming a continental volcanic arc on the edge of the continent above this subduction zone. And here we're forming an oceanic volcanic arc above this subduction zone. And both of these places are places where metal deposits are formed uh, from the concentration of metals that occur by uh, melting and production of um, vapor phases, steam essentially, that rises through the crust carrying metals with it. And that metal will end up uh, often in veins in these volcanic rocks or in veins in granite or will permeate through a granite. Um, but then another type of deposit here, the, this VHMS volcanic hosted mass of sulfides in some places on the seafloor, uh, mineral, mineral rich waters escape in vents from the seafloor and deposit mineral rich um, salts and sulfides and things like that on the seafloor. And then those end up on this conveyor belt of seafloor sediment and seafloor crust that ends up in these subduction zones and often pasted either to the edge of continents or to the edge of volcanic island chains. So that's how, um, in a large sense, uh, metal deposits and especially gold deposits form either um, hosted in volcanic rocks or hosted in, in veins from fluids that are percolating up from some depth. So in Virginia, uh, there's a very clear demarcation of where most of the gold deposits are located. And most of the gold mines are in what we call the gold pyrite belt that runs from up here in Fairfax County uh, let me see if I can do this. This is Fairfax, Prince William, Fauquier, Stafford, Spotsylvania, Orange, Louisa, Goochland, Fluvanna, Buckingham, and Appomattox. So if you live in or near any one of those counties, you may have gold deposits um, nearby. And, and some of these other ones, these are other deposits deposit types, but certainly the main gold pyrite belt that I'm going to be mostly talking about today um, is, is volcanic related. And if we look at a geologic map of Virginia, you can see out here in the west, this is the, these are the uh, Paleozoic sediments that were laid down um, in the great Paleozoic era up to about uh, 250 million years ago when the interior portion of North America was largely flooded during most of that time. And so we have a lot of marine sediments out here, uh, punctuated with some terrestrial sediments. But limestone, sandstone, shale make up the western part of Virginia. And then we have the Blue Ridge kind of running down the, the spine of, of the state. 
that is um, actually a, a slice of, of deep um, continental crust that's been uplifted and pressed westward against the what we call the Valley and Ridge province over here. And then we have the Piedmont province, this big mess in the middle, this big triangle in the middle. And that's, uh, that's made of, um, it's a collection of different slices of crust that were pressed against the edge of North America during um, various tectonic collisions, um, mostly in the late middle to late Paleozoic era. And one of those in particular is the Central Virginia Volcanic Plutonic Belt, also known as the Chapawamsic terrain. And it's this belt of rocks here that runs through uh, from Fairfax. Well, it runs all the way down into North Carolina. But all of uh, the gold deposits and the gold, and the gold pyrite belt of Virginia are located within this Central Virginia Volcanic Plutonic Belt. And this was, in fact, a volcanic island arc off of the coast of North America about 450 million years ago. And then it was pressed against the edge of North America by tectonic plate collisions. And uh, here I'm introducing the uh, DMME online map, online geologic map. If you go to this address up here in the upper left corner, dmme.virginia.gov web maps, and then DGMR, this is the State Geological Survey, the Division of Geology and Mineral Resources. If you go to that web map and you play with the layer controls, uh, you go to the upper right-hand corner and you have to turn on the Mineral Resources of Virginia layer, but it turns on um, our archive of of where we know mining has occurred in the past. And it's, it's very complete for Central and Eastern Virginia, less complete for Western Virginia. I apologize for that, but um, there's only very few of us here. But anyway, for the Central part of Virginia, especially the Gold Pyrite Belt, um, it is complete. And so what you're seeing here are the yellow dots are sand and gravel, quarries and mines. Uh, the green would be fossil fuels. So these are coal mines and um, gas wells, and the red are metals. This is what's called the James River Iron Belt here that runs through Lynchburg. And then if you're familiar with the old iron mines out in Allegheny County, that's what you're seeing here with all these red dots. Uh, but this cluster of red dots running from Appomattox all the way up to Fairfax, this is, these are the gold mines in the, the, um, the Central Virginia Gold Pyrite Belt. And if you zoom in closely and click on any one of these dots, you can get more information about those locations. And I actually suggest that if you're really interested in gold in Virginia, you log into this map and, and play around with it. So let's talk a little bit about um, the history of gold mining in Virginia. We've talked about how the gold got to be here from the early stages of, of our solar system into the, the plate tectonics and plate collisions. But um, yeah, what, what about historic times? Well, it turns out that um, gold has been important to man, to humankind for, for many, many centuries. And the Spanish um, conquest of much of the Americas back in the, the uh, 16th century, the, the mid to late 1500s, had a lot to do with, with gold. And so they were um, extracting gold from native peoples here, the Incas and the Aztecs, and returning it, returning it to Europe. And England, little old England up here, was a fairly latecomer to this game. The Spanish were already well established in the Americas by 1600. And the English started looking around and saying, well, we're missing out on all these riches. What can we do? So in um, 1607, the Virginia Company was formed. You may have heard of the Virginia Company. You may have heard of the Jamestown Settlement. This is 13 years before the Pilgrims landed in Massachusetts. Uh, England sent settlers to, to the central Virginia, um, to the eastern Virginia coast, and they settled near Williamsburg at Jamestown. And this was a financial um, operation, and these guys were looking for minerals. They came here looking for gold, iron, coal, uh, and they weren't very well prepared. They, they really struggled for the first few years. But let's just say um, when they landed here, they were very disappointed to find out 
that number one, the natives um, didn't have gold, didn't really know about gold, and number two, were not all that friendly. So um, it, it took a while for, for gold to be discovered in Virginia. So you may have heard of Thomas Jefferson in 1782, well before he became president of the United States. He was writing about his observations of Virginia, and he knew someone who found a lump of gold or in the Rappahannock River, uh, way down below Fredericksburg. Now we know that gold doesn't um, occur in veins there, but it was, it had been washed there from the Central Virginia Gold Belt and someone picked it up. So in the 1780s, people knew that there was gold in Virginia, but it wasn't really until the earliest um, 1800s, 1806, the first commercial gold was discovered at the Whitehall mine in Spotsylvania County. And this mine became spectacularly productive, uh, especially in the 1840s and uh, 1850s. And some of the, the largest gold nuggets ever found in Virginia, this one here is currently on display in the Mineral Hall in the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History up on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. You can go there and actually see this lump of gold that came from this commercial the first commercial gold mine in Virginia in Spotsylvania County. Uh, so the early methods of gold mining were pretty primitive. They were scooping up gravel with shovels and washing them, you know, because of gold's position in the periodic table, number 79, it's just a couple notches below lead. It's quite dense and it's much denser than the gravel in which it occurs. So, it's much denser than, more dense than the quartz and the sand and the mica and whatever other minerals are in the rocks around it. So if you take gold, if you take uh, gold bearing gravel and mix it with water and shake it pretty well, the gold is gonna sink to the bottom. So people came up with various ways of separating gold from gravel. And this was a very primitive way here, a sluice where they would shovel gravel into the top of this thing and run water through it and shake it down. And there was a series of riffles here. The, if you had enough water flowing through the gravel and sand would wash out the end and the gold would be trapped in the riffles. But it was very, very labor intensive. Uh, another way of doing this was with what they call a, um, a rocker. And this thing is, it's like a cradle. You see it's, it's a wooden box with a handle on the side and it's got these two round wooden rockers on the bottom. They would shovel the gravel into this rocker, pour in water, and just shake, 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 rock it back and forth. And the gold would sink to the bottom and the gravel and sand would wash out. And if you were lucky, you would end up with, with some gold in the bottom. Uh, but then they got a little more ad advanced, but it's still fairly primitive technology, a series of wooden boxes that were powered either by humans shaking them, or um, at some point they figured out how to use water power. Um, they would build dams upstream and create a hydraulic head and let the water run down through a sluice that would turn a wheel that would then shake these boxes. So they put the gravel in these boxes with water and it would shake and the gold would sink to the bottom, but still quite primitive. Um, at some point, Load gold was discovered, and really this, this happened a little later. I'll talk about that a little more after we take a break here in a few minutes. But once they found that um, gold that was still held within, uh, say, quartz-rich rocks, they, they discovered that they had to crush the gold. And a very primitive early way of crushing the gold was to use a device called an arastra. And it was simply a pit with a central spindle and they would load the gold ore into the pit and then they had a big rock tied to a log and they'd make this poor old mule go round and round and round in circles, dragging this rock around the pit until it, it crushed up the ore into a powder and then they'd shovel it out and they'd, then they'd have to go back to some kind of um, gravity separation like a, a rocker box or a sluice box. Okay, so we've been going about 20 minutes. I was planning to speak about um, 40 minutes. And so uh, I was just gonna take a little break here and offer an opportunity for 
people to ask questions before we move on to the second half of the presentation. Tim Shell, how would you like to handle this? Are there any questions yet left? Yeah, some yet? folks um, just typed some questions in the chat for you. Um, one that came up is, are there any gold mining areas open to the public in Virginia? Gold mining areas open to the public. Um, yeah, so, and this, this does raise the question of uh, access access to these old gold mines. They are almost uniformly, almost entirely on private land. So you can't really just wander around without landowner permission. And, and I do have to stress that if, if you're gonna visit at any of these old gold mines, you, you need to get permission from the landowner. Um, but there are some places up in, I think in Prince William, um, no, at, at Lake Anna State Park, you're allowed to, to pan for gold and they actually have some gold panning programs there. Um, at Holiday Lake State Park, at the very southwest end of the, the gold belt. Um, they have some gold mining programs there where you can learn about gold mining and join a ranger to, to pan for gold. But um, yeah, for the most part, it, it's on private land. Now, this is not to say that if you weren't ambitious, you couldn't contact a landowner, do some research and say, you know, I'd like to come on your land and pan for gold. And, and um, people have done this. And I, I'll talk in the second half about um, about ways that you can get involved uh, with with groups that that do this, and and I, I do recommend that you start out by joining a group. Uh, and another one is uh, I, they were curious about the faults in Gold Country in Louisa County uh, and areas where the North Anna Nuclear Power Plant are located. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to um, scroll back up through some of my slides here. Let me um, go back up here to the geologic map of Virginia. So Virginia is riddled with faults. It has a long uh, and active tectonic history, um, plate collisions, plates coming apart. So on this map, every one of these black lines is a fault. And I'd say, well, here's the curious thing about Virginia. Most of these faults that we can see at the surface. So geologists recognize these faults through geologic mapping. We get on the ground and we describe the rocks and where we find a, a major break in what we're seeing or we find a place where the rocks literally look to be broken or crushed, we, we identify that place as a fault and we draw it on the map and then we connect the dots and that's how these faults have been drawn. So Virginia, especially the Piedmont of Virginia, well, the Blue Ridge and the Valley and Ridge also um, are riddled with faults. Most of these faults haven't been active for about 250 million years, literally, uh, to about 200 million years. Some of the faults in the Piedmont have been active more recently. But if you take the, all the earthquakes we know about, and we've been recording, Thomas Jefferson recorded earthquakes back in the 1770s, uh, but since we've had decent instruments, uh, the, since the mid 20th century, we've been able to plot pretty well the locations of earthquakes. And in central Virginia, and I could give another whole talk about this, and maybe we can schedule that sometime. Tim Shell, I think actually one of my early talks at the Science Museum was about earthquakes in Virginia. Nice. But if you plot the epicenters, the locations of the earthquakes, they actually form a cloud that runs between Charlottesville and Richmond. So a, a cluster kind of like this, if you can see what I'm doing with my mouse here, they form a loose cloud. And it's not like California at all, where if you plot up the earthquakes, they actually line up on the faults because their faults are very active. Here in Virginia, we have a much different, and the whole East Coast in general, much different kind of seismicity. The, the, the earthquakes are occurring, as far as we can tell, in between the faults that we see at the surface. And so, um, you know, we can do our best to map these faults. You know, our geologists are very diligent in mapping these faults, but then the earthquakes do not behave at all, and they occur very often where we don't expect them. Now, the, the earthquake that happened in Louisa County, yes, there are some faults that run under the nuclear power plant. 
Yes, there are faults that run all over Louisa County and Fluvanna County and Spotsylvania County, uh, but these are not the faults that were moving in that earthquake. Um, and that's about the best explanation I can give you right now. Uh, I suggest that I come back in a few months and give the earthquake talk again. Sounds like a plan. Um, okay. I have, uh, there's been a lot more questions, but I think for now I'm going to ask uh, one more for you. Um, uh, but I just assure everybody I've got them all. Uh, who founded the White Hall Mine and owned it? And who worked the mines? Were they white settlers? Were they slaves? Were they indigenous people? Uh, yes, yeah, so as far as I know, the indigenous people were already gone by then, driven out by um, violence and disease, and were most, mostly driven off to the west. Uh, there are a few indigenous tribes left in Virginia, but they're greatly, greatly reduced. I've never heard of any records of indigenous people working the mines, but there is some evidence that indigenous people mined copper in central Virginia. Um, there are some copper deposits associated with the gold deposits, and it seems that the ancient peoples that occupied Virginia were more interested in the copper than they were in the gold. And I'm not sure why that is, but um, but copper, it, it does appear that the indigenous peoples mined copper in the way before European settlers arrived. Uh, who owned the 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 um, the early mines? That's a very good question. There, they the the land themselves was owned by the people who owned the land. And then um, speculators, miners would come in and sign an agreement with the landowner to mine the minerals, then the, the landowner would get a fraction of that. We do have some, um, quite a bit of historic information in our archives about these mines. Also, um, the US Geological Survey has some records and toward the end of the talk, I'll show you how you can find out more information about individual mines. I do know that between 1800 and the Civil War, enslaved peoples were used in some of the, the labor in the mines. Um, so I hope I've answered that question. Uh, thank you, David. Um, I'm gonna hold off on more questions right now and let you get back to your talk. Okay, so um, we've talked about the brief history of gold mining in Virginia. Um, or some of the early methods of mining. And here we are at the break. So let's talk about um, some of the, the types of gold deposits in Virginia. So, so the gold originally occurred in veins. This is after all these tectonic processes occurred. And um, these are generally volcanic or volcanic related rocks in central Virginia. And the gold was either uh, layered in there with the volcanic rocks, or it was in veins that cut through the volcanic rocks later. But either way, the gold was embedded in solid rock. And you have to imagine that the surface of the landscape that we see right now is a weathered surface that has been eating its way down through the landscape for about 200 million years. So at one time, uh, there was much, much, much more rock above the surface that we see right now. And that rock has been weathered down by natural processes of um, acidic rainwater and freezing and thawing and flooding and just, just rainwater washing over the land um, eats away at the rock. And what happens is uh, the gold itself, remember the gold itself is fairly inert. It doesn't, um, it doesn't combine with other things and it, it doesn't weather away to, to dissolve in, in rainwater like many of the minerals in the Piedmont do. So uh, when the rock weathers away, there will be gold left behind in the soil above those veins. And then in many cases, that soil will wash down into creeks. And this was the first kind of gold deposit exploited in Virginia, the gold that was in the creek gravels, and that was called placer gold. And then people got smart and they followed the gold in the soil up to where the veins were, and they were able to, with much greater labor, exploit these veins. So they'd have to drive shafts down through solid rock, either following the vein like this, or coming in vertically until they hit a vein, and then they would follow it. So um, yeah, so that's placer gold would be in, in the stream gravels, and then load gold would be in veins or bedded deposits in between the layers of volcanic rocks. So the, the placer gold was 
worked first starting in the early 1800s and then about 1830 is when um, people got smart and what really happened at this point was was uh, foreign investment came in especially from Europe European investors invested in the gold mines in Virginia and allowed them to buy um, the equipment that would allow them to drive shafts down into the the solid rock so here's uh, a few more factoids about um, technology changed the way that mining was done in the um, 1800s especially starting well in 18 the from the earliest days to about 1830s we saw that uh, some of those primitive technologies simple gravity separation with pans and sluices and rockers. And then in the 1830s, these veins were discovered and companies started driving shafts. They used uh, water-driven stamp mills. I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of a stamp mill, but a stamp mill is a device that has heavy wooden or metal blocks that, that would be driven down into um, a bed. So, so the ore would be mined and brought to the surface in chunks, and then it would be run through a stamp mill and these would just be heavy weights that would be dropped down onto the ore to crush it up. And then they would use um, mechanical gravity separation to separate the, the, the gold from the crushed ore. And again, I, I mentioned this happened largely with foreign investment. And this is why uh, if you look at some of the names of the mines, some of them, um, like there are several different mines that have the name London in them or several different periods of of certain mines that, that have the name London in them. And that's because the, the money was coming from England. And then in the 1840s, um, they were separating a lot of fine gold, but the fine gold was often mixed with other heavy minerals like uh, titanium and iron bearing minerals. And so how do you, you separate the, um, the gold, the very fine gold from this other fine sand? Well, they used mercury. Uh, and the gold will sort of bind with the mercury. You, I don't know if you remember the periodic table, but mercury is just one notch above gold on the periodic table. So they're very similar in density. So uh, mercury can be used to literally float sand and quartz and things like that, float it off of the gold, and the gold gets trapped in the mercury. And then it's either separated by gravity or, unfortunately, um, they had to burn off the, the final bits of mercury, which... Um, yeah, so the, the, a lot of mercury was put into the environment during this period, and, and quite a bit of it is still out there. Whoops. 1849 was the peak of gold production at about over 6,000, almost 7,000 ounces per year. This would have been worth about $11 million in, in these uh, in, in modern dollars. So in that one year, the, the mines of Virginia would have produced about $11 million worth of gold. And then in the 1890s, they started introducing steam power. Everything up to that point was, was driven by water wheels. It's amazing uh, the industries that were um, operating throughout the United States before the Civil War that were strictly driven by water power. And, and in my travels throughout the Piedmont of Virginia, I'm always coming across old breach dams and old mill sites where people had backed up water to give themselves a source of power. So uh, a little bit about the history and the, the volume of gold production from Virginia. So here's years across the bottom. Sorry if this is a little fuzzy. Years across the bottom, going back to about 1825. So the early days of gold mining, the 1810s and 20s, there was really not good record keeping. But once the mines went into commercial production around 1830, the United States Treasury, the United States Mint started keeping good records of gold production. And right here about 1830, gold production started skyrocketing in Virginia with the introduction of um, technology, especially mining the load deposits. And it, it, had, um, it had some peaks and valleys, but the peak came in 1849. And then what happened to cause that peak to fall off? Well, this is when 1849 was exactly when gold was discovered in California. So a lot of people packed up and left. And uh, so the industry just kind of declined until the Civil War. 
and during the Civil War, there's there's very little production recorded. And then it picked back up again sporadically after the Civil War. You know, the United States went through several boom and bust cycles uh, in the decades after the Civil War. We had some pretty strong recessions and depressions. And so um, that's, I think, partly what we're seeing here. But curiously, in the first half of the 20th century, there was another resurgence in, in gold production in Virginia. And part of this has to do with they were, um, especially around mineral Virginia, they were um, producing sulfur for industrial purposes for the, construct, for the making of sulfuric acid and for munitions, actually, a lot of sulfur production went into um, munitions. So they were mining pyrite, they were mining fool's gold, and there was some gold mixed in with that. And so that, that is part of why we had this, this boom in, in gold production in the 1930s and early 1940s. Uh, so we had two, two major periods of gold production in Virginia, really the first half of the, the 19th century and then a smaller spike in the first half of the 20th century and largely driven by um, historical events. Uh, but there are still places you can see the, the results of gold mining on the landscape. This is an area in uh, western most Goochland County. And I don't know if you're familiar with LIDAR technology, but we now have the ability to, to do a, a surficial scan of, of the earth to get a very detailed topographic picture using lasers mounted on airplanes. So now we have this complete LIDAR coverage for all of Virginia. If you get down there and start looking at this stuff, you see these weird things. And this one weird thing, this is a very large placer gold mine in this creek valley. So here's this creek draining uh, these ridges that contain load gold. And so this, this creek valley here, this is, this is Bird Creek right here. Um, so this, these creek valleys were um, really full of gold. And this company came in here in the 1930s and hydraulically mined this. You may have seen hydraulic mining on the Discovery Channel and on the History Channel, all that stuff they're doing up in Alaska. A lot of that is hydraulic mining where they're using hoses to mobilize the gravel and then they wash it through sluices. And what you're seeing here are the remnants piled back up uh, in rows after they finished mining these these stream gravels. So that's still out there. It's very hard to walk across this landscape. First of all, because it's swampy. Second of all, because there's all these, these hills. So Virginia had a long history of gold mining, ended pretty much in the first half of the 20th century. But is anything happening now? Well, yes, there's a lot of people out there doing recreational gold panning with the consent of landowners, of course. And all you really need is a shovel and a pan. Uh, but there are organizations, the Central Virginia Gold Prospectors. These people are very organized. It's a club that you can join. And they've actually gotten with landowners and actually leased places where they know there's gold. And so you pay a fee to join this club. It's not very expensive. But um, all the fees, all the, the membership fees together are used to go to landowners and say, hey, we'd like to give you a pot of money annually to allow our club to come and pan gold on your land. So um, I would strongly suggest that you, you contact a group like this if you're interested. Uh, it's a bunch of very, very knowledgeable people. And you can see they've got a meeting coming up in just a few days. And you can look them up, uh, cvgp.net. And they're quite successful. Um, one of them found a one ounce gold nugget. And I don't know if, you, if you've looked at the price of gold lately, but gold, Last time I checked was $1,600 an ounce. So that little pebble in that person's hand is worth over $1,600. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and there is one company right now, um, as I mentioned earlier, our comp our, our, my agency regulates gold mining in Virginia. There's one company right now that has a mining permit to mine gold in Virginia. They haven't reported any commercial production yet, but they're, they've gone into the site of this old moss mine in Western Goochland County, and they're gonna clean up some of the dumps there, and they're gonna rewash the, um, 
essentially the, the tailings that were left over from that mining operation. That mine was abandoned in the 1930s and there were no mine reclamation laws back then. So they just left the site as it was. There are some, actually some buildings on the site that are decrepit and need to be torn down. So this is pretty much a one man operation. He's gonna go in there and clean up the site and see if he can extract some gold from, from what's left there on the site. But this is the only um, operating gold mine in Virginia right now. But there's one company, there's a Canadian company called Aston Bay Holdings. Uh, this is not a secret at all. They're, they're quite proud of what they've discovered. And this isn't even in the gold pyrite belt. You can see their location map down here. It's just west of the gold pyrite belt. But they've discovered this, this vein of gold on a big tree plantation out in western Buckingham County. And they've arranged a lease with uh, the landowner. And they're out there drilling. And they've discovered some very interesting, uh, pretty high concentrations of gold in this in this quartz vein that runs through this property. And so um, who knows, we may have another gold mine in Virginia at some point in the future. Uh, so how can I learn more about gold in Virginia? Well, you can drive around in the old gold mining areas and read some of the historical markers. There are a few of them around the state. This one is in my hometown of Dillwyn, Virginia. And then up in, um, this one is up in Spotsylvania County, I think, or Fauquier, somewhere up in the northern Piedmont, Goldfain, Virginia. And then Stafford County also has a historical marker, and they talk about the different mines that are there. And you can actually go into some of our publications, and I'll show you that in a minute, and actually find these mines and learn more about them and exactly where they are. Uh, our website, dmme.virginia.gov, we've got a lot of information about gold on there. And if you go into our web store at dmme.virginia.gov slash commerce, and you just type gold into the little box here, you get a whole list of all of our different stuff that talks about gold. And a couple I can recommend, uh, this publication 19 by Palmer Sweet. He was one of my first supervisors when I came here. Back in the early 80s, he produced this, this publication called uh, Gold in Virginia. Same title as my talk here. Sorry, and this, this is organized by county, and you can look up any county in Virginia uh, or any county that has gold in it, and there's a map showing where the different mines are. And then there's text where you can follow these numbers and, and learn about each one of these mines. Uh, also, uh, despite the author of this volume, it's actually a pretty good um, record of the gold mines. This actually has topographic maps in it that that show the um, the locations of many of the old gold mines. And, and again, I have to um, remind you that, that they are almost entirely on private land, and so you should always seek permission of the landowner. And if you discover anything like a deep hole like this, or a mine shaft, or even just the hole going into the side of the hill. Don't go in there. We have a program here at DMME called Stay Out, Stay Alive. The best way to stay safe is not to crawl in holes in the ground that are left over from mining. Uh, up in um, Monroe Park in Fauquier County, this is actually a county park. There's the Gold Mine and Camp Museum, the official gold mining interpretive center for the Commonwealth of Virginia. This is a place you can go and learn a lot, a lot, a lot about gold. They happen to be closed right now because of the virus, but I'm sure they'll be back um, at some point in the future. But their website is very rich in information and you can, can check there. Uh, but you go to these various counties in the gold belt and you, you just never know what you're gonna find. This is not too far from where I live in Buckingham County. And uh, the Central Virginia Gold Prospectors, as a matter of fact, were digging along this creek and they came upon this big granite block, this big four piece granite block that clearly had some worn places in it. And this has been identified as part of a Chilean mill where gold ore would have been crushed back in the 1800s along uh, whatever, creek, whatever creek they were on. And this has since been moved to the Buckingham Historic Village. But my point is there are many, many different ways you can learn about what's happening with, with or what has happened with gold in Virginia. So just to review briefly, gold is a chemical element and it's a mineral and it's a precious metal. All the gold on earth formed in explosions of ancient stars way before our solar system even formed. 
But on Earth, gold is concentrated into gold deposits by the processes of plate tectonics. Um, our gold pyrite belt that runs through our Piedmont is within a volcanic island arc. We learned a little bit about volcanic island arc uh, that, that formed about 450, 450 million years ago. And Virginia was the largest gold producing state in those years before the California gold rush. And the last thing I'd like to leave you with is, yes, we've had a lot of gold mining in Virginia, but uh, there is still gold out there to be found. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. That was an excellent talk. Um, I, I put a couple of links to uh, the DMME site that you mentioned so that folks could cl click on it in the chat. Um, and I was trying to think, is there any other questions that I missed? A lot of thank yous, by the way. Oh, well, you're welcome. <laughs> um, I think one that I didn't ask um, from earlier uh, was that, that maybe we can end on was that, is there a correlation between radon and gold deposits? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. I would say... And just off the cuff here, no. Um, we have a pretty good idea of where radon is coming from in Virginia. And radon tends to come from a couple of different sources. Um, so you, uranium and thorium produce radon. And the rocks, yeah, there are rocks in central Virginia that have quite a bit of radium and thorium. There, there are certain minerals that tend to um, absorb radium and thorium. So um, those would be the minerals that, that produce radon. And so things like um, pegmatite, so granitic, granitic rocks. Um, but I wouldn't say in central Virginia, I, I'd say that the rocks that are hosting the gold, <laughs> there may be radon sources nearby, but they're not necessarily associated with the gold. The, the other source of radon is phosphate minerals. And so, um, especially in our coastal plain, some of the uh, shell deposits uh, contain bones and actual phosphate nodules. They can be quite high in uranium and thorium. And so there are places, say in the Williamsburg area, that, um, that have high radon because of literally the, the fossil bones that are in the deposits beneath the ground. And also, uh, surprisingly, some areas in the, in the Shenandoah Valley where there are um, phosphate minerals in the limestones and dolomites over there. And I, I got to say, we don't have good mapping on, on radon in Virginia. That's something that uh, we should probably get someone like FEMA to invest in at some point. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you guys for joining us today at Lunch Break Science. Next week um, is uh, Dr. Jim Carter. He's the Professor Emeritus of Geography at Illinois State University, and he's actually going to be talking about ice formations, which in July I think might feel very nice to think about some cold uh, ice formations. Thank you again, David, uh, for giving an excellent talk on Golden Virginia, and stay safe and healthy, everybody. Bye.